So I was there for two months before we had a reorganization in the company. I went on holiday and by the time I got back, I was going solo already. Am I the right person for this? Am I qualified enough to do this? Being myself, I'm kind of juggling everything. I don't think like HR really ever stuck out to me. I always thought that I was going to be doing like hotel operations. It's really, really interesting how beneficial switching roles and industries can be for a company. We have this one colleague who has like a medical background and is now an analyst and that helps him in his work. For us in this specific situation, it's like, oh, it's a match made in heaven. It's like perfect. There's all these different opportunities if we are, you know, open to that idea. And you can be a fantastic writer, data analyst, everything. But if you're not, it's not going to work out. These are my skills. These are my weaknesses. This is the little blurb about my life and what I'm going to share. You know, we're not hiring a list of pros and cons. We want to work with a person. The last time we implemented something super, super drastic was we knew going into it that there are all these studies and stuff, organizations that have unlimited leave policies, employees end up taking less leave. A lot of companies need to do that. Mm -hmm. It's such a good investment and it's good for the employees as well. It's like, hey, I want to see your numbers in the negative by the end of the year. <laughs> and I always felt happy when you know, the work that I did, I could see like a visible impact on the people around me. I've been asking something really risky. Yeah. Some of the answers I got are amazing. And at the end of the day, she's like, okay, it's yours now. And I was like, oh my God. Marcel, so switching industries from hotel management to HR, HH. Mm -hmm. How did you do that? Yeah, it was really interesting. Um, I actually, when I was studying hospitality management, um, there were all these different kind of departments or ideas of like where you could go and what you can do. I think it was something like in my school, like there was a statistic like 90% of the people in my, in my school, in my course, don't actually stay in the hospitality industry. So it was always kind of like this undertone that like, oh, some people go and do sales, some people go into do marketing, um, and some people do um, like hospitality related uh, work, but I don't think like HR really ever stuck out to me like in that sort of way. Um, I always thought that I was going to be doing like hotel operations and that sort of thing because it was something I was like really, really good at and I have um, quite a good like, like skill with customers and that sort of thing. Um, and so it was not something that was really on my radar for a long time. And as I was uh, studying and doing internships and trying out different roles and that sort of thing, I jumped from um, like the food and beverage sites, working in the restaurant, uh, doing guest service and then front office and then uh, being like in operations management and duty management. Um, and that like really gave me like a lot of experience and exposure to like the different sides of the yeah. of, of like the hospitality industry. Um, and then I had the opportunity to uh, be in the team to open a hotel in, in Copenhagen. So that was also like I thought I knew about everything about hotels and then I opened a hotel and that was like even more of an eye opener. Wow. And you had to relocate for this position. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I got to stay in a hotel for six months, which was great. But oh, wow. Yeah, because it was empty. So yeah. it was really, really cool. Um, but yeah, I had like all of this uh, experience and exposure to the different sides of everything to do with um, hotels and the hospitality business. And once I had finished that internship, I was like confronted, like, okay, now what do I, w which of these experiences, which of these roles have like appealed to me and what do I want to do kind of full time? And still, even then I was like, yeah, you know, I'm not really like super attached to any of these experiences that I had that I'm like, I absolutely want to do this, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and so I was looking, I was, I came back to Amsterdam because this was in Copenhagen when I had opened this hotel. Uh, I came back to Amsterdam. I was looking for a job for quite some time. It was like two or three months and it was a disaster. Were you looking for hotel management positions as well? Yeah. So yeah. I was applying for uh, operations management, duty management, like uh, front office manager, that sort of thing. Um, but also I was like, you know what, let's let's open this up a bit and apply for like some other kind of roles and stuff. So I, I dipped my waters into, dipped my waters, I dipped my toes into <laughs> um, uh, some applications for like office manager um, and community manager, this sort of thing. And I was like, yeah, these, these could be interesting. I kind of like the vibe of what's, what's going on with these, uh, with these job descriptions. Um, and eventually I was in this inter interview process for this one role at my previous company um, that was like an office manager role, uh, but kind of intertwined with this role were some like very basic like uh, HR responsibilities. So um, 
things to do with a lot of like administration and uh, organizing new hires and onboarding people and uh, giving them like the tour around the office and well, the fun stuff. Yeah, all the fun stuff of like, um, yeah, but also also the not so fun stuff of, like the processes and. Yeah. Um, Did you have to process like levers, starters? Documents yeah, and yeah, stuff? and all their like the equipment and that sort ah. of thing. So uh, a lot of the kind of nitty gritty of like the HR stuff. Um, so it was like a good little like introduction exposure into it. And so after some time of doing this role and also doing all the things to do with office management, I really realized it's like, oh, um, I really like the HR part mm. and this is really great. And I, I realized that um, what I liked about working in hospitality was the people aspect and like interacting with the people and, um, you know, kind of on a daily basis, uh, helping people and that, that sort of thing. It's, it's just something that really was super, super, super nice. And it, I always felt happy when, um, you know, the work that I did, I could see like a visible impact on the people around me. And the kind of drawback to that in the hospitality was it was very emotionally draining mm. to be doing, at least for me, like with 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 uh, customers every day and you deal with complaints and requests and that sort of thing. And you have to kind of keep this, you know, your hospitality persona yeah. um, up and running for hours and hours on end and you're standing on your feet and you're tired and this sort of thing. And so I realized for me it was it was almost too emotionally draining to be sustainable. Um, but I still like had love for the people side of, of the work. Uh, and I also had like the skills and experience to do that sort of thing. So I was like, you know what, doing this sort of thing, but internally for like the company and like, it's just one group of, okay, now 70 people, but <laughs> <laughs> that's at least my company now. Um, it's, 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 it's much nicer. And I think it's, it's the perfect, uh, sort of role for me to, to, to do it that way. So I kind of like spun it around. And the working hours make a difference. As oh, well. absolutely. Ooh. Absolutely. Oh my God. Did it was... you work nights? Yeah, Ooh. actually. So I had, I had a, when I was studying, I, um, for two years, I did night shifts, like one night shift a week, uh, in my school. Cause I was like trying to make a little bit of money and this sort of thing. And so wow. I had my sleep schedule completely ruined. Um, but now I'm like an expert at jet lag. So that is <laughs> at least at least one of the benefits from that. But like I have done every sort of kind of shift. But normally it's like 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. And then night shifts are 11 to 7. Yeah. And that sort of schedule really throws everything uh, out the window when it comes to like scheduling things with friends. Cause oh, it's almost, impossible. Yeah. Almost never things things can almost never line up or someone is, is had to work that evening shift and so they can't make it for a dinner or whatever. But the only benefit from that is that usually you would have a day off during the week and then yeah. you can go shopping when there's no one around. I, that's that's something I do miss. But yeah. no, I, I really uh, enjoy the kind of corporate nine ish to five ish yeah um like structure that i have now yeah it's 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 you know it's weird to say but it's it's more freeing for me because i don't have to think about oh uh what's my schedule going to be like am i able going to be able to attend this event in a month because i don't know if i'm going to be off that evening or yeah. something like that yeah so yeah. definitely a, a a good change for me i really yeah. appreciated that yeah i also came from i did hospitality and then i did dentist assistant work that was really mm -hmm. easy to transition um you don't need previous experience and then recruitment and I had a similar story to you I liked the people aspect of all these positions yeah restaurant work is fun you mm -hmm. use your body more at the moment in recruitment you use your brain more and you get mm -hmm. fatigued at the end of the day mm -hmm. I do love making coffees though that's something I yeah. miss it is a lot of fun <laughs> and desserts yeah that's an experience but the hours sometimes mm -hmm. I'd work I worked in a Chinese restaurant so the free dinners were great. Oh my God. Yeah. But the breaks were 30 minutes sometimes for like a 10 hour day. Yeah. Um, and then you'd have to pick up overtime because someone called in sick or someone is late. Um, so that wasn't fun. But mm -hmm. the people, it's like a support system yeah. in hospitality. Trauma isn't bonding. It? Trauma <laughs> bond. There you go. Um, no, but really, I, I really uh, think that you get so close with your colleagues in yeah. such a short period of time. Uh, when you work in hospitality, because it's really like intense and you're really working together i would i would say and for the most part now okay i work with a lot of my colleagues on certain things for hiring certain roles or that yeah. sort of thing but it's not like we are 
struggling together to mm. to to make it to the end of the shift or trying to stay awake yeah 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 <laughs> no and how does that differ from from now then so how you work at the moment because you're working by yourself and you don't mm. have a team right yeah so i don't have a, I have a i don't have a team uh per se in hr um i'm kind of situated within the finance team um right now so i report into our our cfo and i work closely um with uh two of our other finance colleagues when it comes to things like payroll and such um and so since i'm kind of situated in the finance team i'm like involved in um more projects that kind of relate to finance so it's like some cost saving things some things of like using new tools and that sort of uh in that regard um but yeah it's 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 interesting not having an entire team because i feel like if i had an entire team we would be having a completely different focus and like mm. doing uh different projects and tasks and stuff because then it would be i don't know the um what's it called bandwidth to do that sort of thing um at the moment being myself i'm kind of juggling everything so it's like okay there are days i'm like oh i have to do payroll because that deadline is coming up or i have to renew this contract now or this sort of thing and so a lot of things happen um as like as they come like very very ad hoc and i am able to like deal with all those things happening but because I'm doing that by myself, it's mm. uh, like the projects and stuff that I want to work on are things that are like, oh, if I have time, I get I get to do After this sort those. of thing. Yeah. Um, and it's fun to do those projects and, you know, like improvements and um, implementing new processes like unlimited leave or this sort of thing, which was like super, super interesting or changing our benefit plan. Um, and those things I was I was able to do more easily and actually. Um, I think the last time we implemented something super, super drastic was when uh, I still had a team of, of two other people. Um, but yeah, in my role now, it's 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 mostly like all the maintenance of like, okay, mm. we're, we're, we're not hiring 10 people a month or that sort of thing. It's like, okay, we're hiring a replacement for or for someone who, who left or something. Or we have like the cycle of interns coming in and out and I'm hiring those interns again and again. And we just had... Um, a moment where we hired four people like last month and they started uh like two weeks ago or something yeah and i was like oh we don't hire someone for two months and now we have like four people and so it's 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 yeah it things just come uh as they come at this at this point so uh i hope that sometime soon i can uh, have a little team of my own yeah um get an intern for yourself yeah yeah an intern maybe 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 a partner or something like that we'll see how it goes what would you get, like a talent acquisition person, a more HR focused person? Um, probably more okay. HR uh, focused person, like to do some cool projects and stuff like mm. that. Because I feel like um, <clears throat> talent acquisition person, maybe if, if if the business needs it, if we're like, okay, we're hitting the the gas on 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 expanding and growing. Um, I don't know if that will be particularly the case. I feel like now, ever since. Uh, uh, COVID um, and you know, other things happening in the industry. We see a lot of like tech layoffs and everything. Mm. I feel like the mentality is to um, try to like make use of the resources we have in the most effective way possible and not yeah. kind of overshoot and try to hire way too many and then have to like course correct later. So yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's probably the mentality we're going for nowadays. You hired most of the people at the company or did it come like um, that? Yeah, that's interesting. I would have to do with the calculation of how many people we hired and how many people have left since the time that I've, 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 I've come. Um, but no, I would say most people have been at least like a year and a half or more at the company. So that's uh, around the time that I have been at the company. So um, yeah, I think in, in the last year or so that I've been here maybe like 20 to 30 people that have like onboarded in that time wow yeah with everything else going on yeah well. shifts actually probably probably closer to 20 than to 30 but yeah that, that seems pretty fair no that's a lot and yeah. I remember you mentioned to me the stuff you implemented at the company mm -hmm. was it the vacation yeah days as well which is a lot of companies need to do that mm -hmm. it's such a good investment and it's good for the employees as well yeah are we allowed to talk about yeah it? of course yes it's yeah. unlimited right holidays yes. yeah how is that going it's good um so we actually implemented it on the first of january of last year of 2023 um and we knew going into it that there are all these studies and stuff uh saying that um companies organizations that have unlimited leave policies that employees end up taking less leave right 
Uh, and so that's something that, you know, uh, employees have heard as well and um, that we're like nervous about. And so we wanted to like take a proactive approach to that as well. Um, and so instead in our, in our platform that we have, our HRIS, um, HR information system for those at home, um, is uh, we use Bamboo. Uh, we have a, a bucket, for lack of a better word, of how many hours you have to take uh, at the company. And so <clears throat> let's say in the Netherlands, it's 160 hours statutory uh, minimum. And in a normal situation, you would have a bucket of how many hours you can take uh, in the year. Um, and once I got to zero, then you're, you're kind of out yeah. of luck, right? Sometimes you can go a little bit over depending on how flexible your company is. Um, but the way we do it now is that we still have that 160 minimum, but uh, sorry, 160 hours, but it's not the maximum. We actually put it as the minimum that you should take. And wow. so I encourage people, it's like, hey, I want to see your numbers in the negative by the end of the year. <laughs> I don't want it at zero. I want it in the negative. Yeah. Because uh, I, I want them to be taking as much holiday as they need, uh, you know, and um, it's, it's, it's only beneficial to have your employees like uh, well rested and taking care of themselves and everything, you know. Uh, combating all these sort of things of like burnout and everything yeah. that can happen this can really negatively Im influ Im impact like not only the company, of course, like the company is important, but like the people themselves in the long run, it's so much better to just give them one more, one or two or three more days of holiday. Yeah. Um, heck, maybe even like 10 more days of holiday. I, I don't care if they're doing their job. Honestly, I could Reward care less. Them. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so uh, we have this system. And at the same time, I am doing reports every month with the people leads and the managers uh, seeing it's like, OK, um, quarter one, how much holiday are people taking? How much holiday is planned as well? Because with certain quarters, you know, like at the end of the year, people take more holidays or in the summer, people take more holidays. Mm. And so uh, I'm tracking that over the year and seeing as, okay, are there any uh, outliers? Is someone taking uh, a, a lot of holiday at the start of the year? And is, is that a red flag? Is it not a red flag? Um, but also, like, what is a red flag is mm. really, really interesting. Um, so a lot of the time I'm also approaching people and be like, hey, have you planned any holidays? Like, uh, can we make sure also some people just don't put their holidays in, mm. like they will like ask to take time off, but not log it in the system. Um, and so I, I, I find I'm, I'm chasing people to take holidays still, but it that is. That doesn't sound too bad. No, it's actually really, really nice to, I think, I think I will find it nice to be approached and be like, Hey, you should take some holidays, yeah, you know? I would love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And also we don't have uh, a situation where people are abusing the system, at least not just yet. Um, but um, yeah, I feel like we came into this uh, like policy and procedure with unlimited leave with the mentality that um, everyone who works at our company is like a rational adult yeah. who knows how to self-regulate themselves. And if they need holiday, that they will take it and they are capable and they're empowered to, you know, um, if they want to work remotely uh, somewhere for a few weeks, they absolutely can. Uh, if they want to um yeah take take more leave than 25 days that's absolutely fine like um it's it's yeah it's it also I, w I would think it feels good as uh, an employee to feel like okay my employer kind of trusts me yeah to do that as well so with big projects like the vacation days implementation and all the other stuff going on that's a lot of responsibility mm -hmm. on your shoulders and you were there for two months before you was it promotion or? Yeah. So I was there for two months before uh, we had a reorganization in the company. Uh, and then I went on holiday. And by the time I got back, that's when uh, the transition uh, happened that my two managers were leaving. And so it was, I think I joined in October. And in March, I was going solo already. So that was less than six months. It was like four months or something at the company that I was like, okay, taking the reins, which was... Um, a lot to say the least. So you must have had a bit of imposter syndrome, maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when the opportunity of, well, I guess it was an opportunity, the situation of um, me doing most of the HR work uh, solo, uh, of course, with support of like different departments and um, labor lawyer and that sort of thing. So I wasn't like completely on my own. Um, it was very daunting. And it was very much the case of like, oh, 
am I the right person for this? Am I qualified enough to do this? And at the same time, I was having, you know, my managers telling me, it's like, no, Marcel, like you, you were, uh, you've picked up everything so fast. You really have the processes down. Like, you know what's going on. You have all this information. And we, 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 we trust that you can handle like all of the necessities of all the admin work and everything that needs to be done to keep deal room running, you know? And it's, it's, it's one thing to sort of hear, hear that. It's another thing to like really believe it. Yeah. And I was very, very nervous. I remember the, the, the last day that I had with my manager and at the end of the day, she's like, okay, it's yours now. And I was like, oh my God. And then the I, gut feeling, mm -hmm. like the drop in your stomach. Mm -hmm. And I remember like the next day I was like, okay, you know, I, I, I can't like shoot her a message anymore to ask something or clarify something. I have to kind of ride solo. And like, I was like, okay, uh, my manager was super, super lovely. And she was always saying, is like, if you need anything, any, inf any information, like a, a refresh on something you forgot or you're not sure where to find a certain, th certain thing, you can always like ask me and reach out. And definitely in the first like two weeks or so, I was like sending her like a message here and there. But at a certain point, I was like, actually, I, I kind of know what's going on. I kind of know where to find everything. And we had set it up in such a way that, um, well, at the, at, especially at the start, we were working with a recruitment partner for some roles, especially some like more advanced tech roles. Uh, and so I had that part to lean on towards for the like more intense recruitment side. Um, if there was some anything like out of the ordinary uh, to do with like uh, payroll or contracts or that sort of thing, I was had the opportunity to um, work with and in contact with a labor lawyer. So I had all of the tools to like really get it done. So that was quite comforting. I was like, okay, I have someone or something to turn to. Uh, in the case that I don't know what's going on, uh, which was very comforting. And over time, it's got a lot better. And I don't think I ever had like such a disaster happen that, <laughs> well, yeah, really hopefully good. not yet, um, where I was really like, oh, this is like totally out of my wheelhouse. I'm totally not skilled for this, not prepared for this, whatever. Um, and mostly with every new opportunity that came, I was like, oh, this is interesting. And my boss would ask me, I was like, oh, have you ever had to, you know, have a conversation with someone uh, to let them know that we're not extending their contract. And I'm like, no, I haven't even sit, sit, sat in on a conversation like this before. Oh, wow. And um, and so I, I also had to, like, equip myself with these skills. So I was, like, proactive in doing an online HR course. Um, and I, I, you know, went through this whole course, watching all these training videos, this sort of thing. And, yeah, and so I had to carry out these processes like uh, performance management and tracking every quarter, like how are uh, people doing? Like yeah. we do like a nine grid process and that sort of thing. Oh, wow. Yeah, and so um, picking up these these, these tools and like you, then you realize it's like, oh, you have everything at your fingertips. Uh, we had this conversation the other day about uh, being English speakers and like non-Dutch speakers working in a Dutch workplace. Yes. And how there is like sort of a stigma, especially in HR, that you really need to know Dutch in order to work in this industry, right? Yeah. And I remember when I was looking for HR roles, it was like, yeah, Dutch required, Dutch required, Dutch required. But we find in this day and age, we have like the tools and resources necessary. And the internet is your best friend to find anything you need in English or with a tra translator or Deep that sort of thing. Yeah. You mentioned that Deepo, I have to still use oh, that. Oh, you haven't tried no, it? No, 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 no. Oh, it's it's great. It's very fluent. So if you try it in your um, the languages that you know first to just mm -hmm. confirm that it works, I've done it in Italian and English, etc. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very fluent, mm -hmm. in my opinion. So I hope for Dutch emails and um, what have I written in before French? I've written mm -hmm. a, a French job description mm -hmm. uh, with that, and it was quite accurate. Mm -hmm. So I was really, I got like a French person to like have a look. Um, I've written a Spanish job description like that as well, just to, because you use like the inverted, uh, no, sorry, the um, triangle things. What is it called when you're like, yeah, like paraphrasing something? Yeah, these. Yes. <laughs> what is this? Like when you make a heart. Yeah. I and mean, like the less than speech. greater than, but there must be some yes. sort of, it's not a bracket. It's something else. Yeah. But. I'm sure someone will write in the comments. What <laughs> Let it us know down is. below. <laughs> <laughs> but how did you feel then? So your manager sounds like she did a great job handing everything over smoothly, making mm -hmm. sure that you had the correct tools and processes all in place to have a comfortable and smooth uh, future mm -hmm. but when you were alone so you, I want to just touch on that a bit yeah 
really how did you feel at that moment in time were you thinking oh my god i'm not cut out for this mm -hmm. i i was thinking like i'm going to forget something um <clears throat> and the thing is like i i i pride myself in like being a quick learner and like i i, I I'm able to to grasp, you know, concepts and processes and that sort of thing like fairly quickly. But I the part that I thought I would really struggle with and I actually did struggle with from time to time was really juggling all of these things on my own and remembering it's like, okay, I am doing all these processes and doing all this administration, but I cannot forget that this is the this is the deadline for payroll and I have to do this before this date and also check up on all the contracts that are expiring. And we have this process that we do every four months and this process we do every three months and this process that we do every six months that I'm like have to keep track of in my calendars and this sort of thing. And so Google Calendar is my best friend mm. and it really, really helps me like keep organized and uh, plan and everything. And sometimes I, I think that there's a lot in my calendars, but there's a lot that is still like up here. And I think, oh, my God, if I ever have to hand over absolutely everything to someone, it's going to be. Uh, I'm not a disaster. Let's not say a disaster. It's going to be a challenge for sure. <laughs> and so you, with your previous experience, you were an office manager and you touched on HR. Yeah. I guess the workload now is completely different yeah. to what you were doing before. So did management ever question your abilities or they really fully trusted you at the beginning? Yeah. Um, I think more than anything, I was hired... Uh, for my current role based on like my attitude and my motivation and I feel like uh, also like the, the the people skills and that sort of thing um, especially at uh, the company Zoku that I work for they had a, a mantra that like they're a good company company and they hire people for for their character more for their skills because they were like yeah we can we can train anyone to uh, to make a coffee or to check someone into a room or uh, clean something a certain way or serve something a certain way and i feel like for the most part um with a lot of um roles and skills you can do that if you have the right attitude you have the right mindset right motivation you can yeah. you can do a lot of things and so um yeah we, we see a lot of like developers who studied psychology or something and eventually they're like i want to try something do different and they take a a coding boot camp and then Suddenly they're, they're a developer and they're like a wonderful developer because they also have like a really interesting um, insider outlook into, um, I don't know, user interface or something because they have that psychology background. And it's yeah. so, so interesting how um, we have a lot of people in our intelligence unit because um, we do a lot of research and uh, reports and projects um, about different industries in, 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 in fintech and, and VC and all these like startups and that sort of thing that everyone that like we, we will always find someone who has some kind of experience with something yeah so uh we have one person we just hired who was studying to become a doctor and now he can help us with like our health tech reports and that sort of thing and so it's really really interesting how beneficial switching roles and in industries can be for a company oh thank you oh it's so good i think so many companies need to adopt that mindset. And do you think there will be that switch this year for a lot of people will pivot because mm -hmm. of the market, because of the demand, mm -hmm. for example, with retail is going to digress to um, warehousing or um, e-commerce. Mm -hmm. um, but this, I mean, being a doctor or studying to be a doctor and then going into, you know, what is it? Again? Like data analytics oh, and this sort so of thing. Studying yeah. to be a doctor and going into data analytics. Mm -hmm. It's, very different, but the fact that you can pinpoint people's different skills yeah. and contribute and add something to the company is, is incredible. And I think that could be the future. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's really interesting because uh, I don't know how maybe for other companies, but for, for us in this specific situation, it's like, oh, it's a match made in heaven. It's like perfect to have the skills we need and also like a knowledge base that otherwise someone would have to learn that they have already. Mm. But also we have people who are working on those reports on health tech and stuff that have to learn it along the way mm. and they're able to do that. And so it's, it's, it's really, um, as I was saying, a, th a fact of character and motivation that I think uh, people in HR and recruiters and stuff will have to a little bit, maybe be a little bit more open-minded towards uh, this sort of thing. I know that, um, a lot of people are putting a lot of focus towards learning and development, yeah. um, upskilling, reskilling, this sort of thing. And 
you know, you have people in, in your company that are, are great and they're wonderful people. And sometimes the business needs change. And unfortunately, we have to let people go. But there are a lot of opportunities to to reskill people if they're really, you know, like motivated and, and, yeah. and attached to the company and really aligned with the, the goals of the company. There's always a way that you can, um, yeah, upskill, reskill, realign, but also respecting that person's wishes and desires and what they want to do. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. yeah. And you hire lots of interns per year, right? And I think interns are a great example to hire someone who doesn't have experience mm -hmm. and has an educational background relating to that topic. How has that been different for you? Yeah. So we have a, a, a couple of interns in different roles and sometimes we, we shift those around and stuff. So typically the roles we hire interns for like graphic design. Uh, we had like sales interns. We had like a data intern at one point. Um, and we have Actually, the most roles that we hire for interns are uh, in our intelligence research, data analytics, sort of. Uh, wow. Yeah. And so they, they, they do a lot of like data analytics and writing reports and working with clients, and that sort of thing. Um, and the type of people that we get actually for those roles, it's like, OK, some people are work are having like e e economics majors and that sort of thing. Um, some really have like a marketing background or just a general business or that sort of thing. But there are all of these skills and, um, you know, things you learn in those courses that really help you in that sort of role. But one of the things we find ourselves really looking for in those interns is how much do you know about, um, like, our industry? Hmm. And are you motivated? Like, do you keep uh, track of things that are happening in, in venture capital and startups and that sort of thing? Because being invested in the type of work that you do um, is is the thing that's going to push you forward and really yeah. going to make you excel. Like you're going to be um, seeking out this information and reading these articles yourself. And um, if you are just a person with all these skills, but not the interest, yeah, the interest or the character or um, the yeah, motivation to do this type of work, it's not going to work out. And you can be a fantastic writer, data analyst, everything, but if you're not like in the industry, yeah. it's not going to work out. An analytics internship sounds so insane. Mm -hmm. um, sounds really intense. Like the sales ones and marketing are the most popular ones you get um, in companies in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. I think they're the easiest ones to kind of transition to. Maybe sales is a bit scary yeah. as an internship. Do they have to call people? Yeah, or? so they, they sit in oh, with wow. calls and such like that. We had oh. a, an intern recently. Um, I think it was in one of his last days. Uh of his internship that he was like co-leading a deal and he signed his very first deal like a few days before uh he left the company oh. and so it was like really really cool everyone was like so so happy and like celebrating with him and it was really really nice but like it it, it was like a really long process to like you know build that sort of like confidence to like mm. lead the the calls and stuff because with, with sales you have to have a lot of knowledge on on the product yeah. and how it works and the industry and the clients that you're talking to and it can be super super intimidating yeah. especially if you're I don't know, 2021, 20, and wow. this is your first kind of experience working in this kind of role. Um, no, it's 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 really really cool that we we were able to have that. It was quite an achievement. We were very happy with that. It sounds amazing, and I'm sure the intern um, went home super happy. Yeah. And it's such a big achievement for their um, experience and their CV as well to go yeah. to another employer and tell them what they achieved. Mm -hmm. But I can't even imagine. But I'm still trying to wrap my head around the analytics side. Um, is like a university degree enough experience to do a, a position like this of course you get onboarded you have like a supervisor mm -hmm. and an internship as well um is it like a, a slow burning role or do interns because they're younger they just tend to pick things up very quickly and they're mm -hmm. eager to learn yeah it's it's uh, really interesting i think for like our more like analytics uh roles we call them innovation analysts um in our in our company uh we say that it, it takes a couple of months mm -hmm to really get into the cycle of it because there's a variety of different industries and topics and stuff like that that go into all the reports and research that we do at the company that it really just does take the exposure and the time and the work to really get the ball rolling and for you to understand, oh, this is exactly what, you know, our, our, our focus is what we're doing, how we're processing this data, how we're writing about this data, how we're dealing with the clients that commission reports, 
uh, how we're self-initiating reports and stuff like that. And so um, whenever I speak to um, interns and potential candidates and our, our managers who are hiring for these roles, they always mention, yeah, the first three to six months is really going to be an intense training period because you have to um, have all this knowledge. And But once you get that knowledge, you really are just rolling and you, you, you know what you're doing and you can, um, yeah, eventually like lead the reports by yourself with a client and everything. And it's, I think that's so cool. That's amazing. So after hiring interns and experiencing that, so people getting an in at a company that way, doing an internship that's relevant and doing um, a job related to that or how you experienced it. So in hospitality, in Horika, moving into HR, if you could pick, if young Marcel could pick, oh, wow. which way would you go? Yeah, um, I think I would still pick the the route where I, I hopped around and yeah? I tried different things and everything. Because I think for me, I had a lot of worry in the like, what if I pick this instead of this? What, what if I had tried X, Y, or Z? And I feel like having had my little sampling platter of different roles in the industries, I was able to really find something that suits me that I really, really like. Uh, and not that, you know, it's like, oh, I have a business degree technically and I should, mm. and it's focused in hospitality that I should definitely work in a business context in hospitality or in a, in a, in a hotel somewhere. Yeah. And I think that um, I didn't really like change industries absolutely completely. I feel like I learned a lot about HR in my court, in my, in my, in my studies, in my university and everything. But um, having the hospitality experience like definitely helps me in my role in HR every day. And the way that I've explained to you is like, yeah, we have this one colleague who has like a medical background and is now uh, an analyst and that helps him in his work. You know, yeah. there's all these different opportunities if we are, you know, open to that idea that would really like benefit, you know, the company and make us open to, to more things because I'm sure... Um, if we just hired and, and and trained and picked one industry since we were like, I don't know, 16 to 18 going to university or picking your your track, um, yeah, it would be, I think, a much more, I would say, less creative yeah. uh, perspective into in the way we do business and work. It's enormous pressure. Yeah. I struggled so hard with school, um, could not pay attention at all. and. I liked different things. Maybe you as well when you're younger, you just like, you have multiple hobbies, you like different things. So mm -hmm. how can you stick to one thing at 16 years old forever yeah. and retire mm -hmm. doing the same thing? Yeah. Um, and yeah. as we're learning now, it's people have to pivot mm -hmm. to match the market. Yeah. So And, and people change themselves. I mean, yeah. I absolutely despised math when I was in, in, in high, middle high school. Yeah. And then uh, I moved to university and I'm like, oh, finance is amazing. And I re find it really interesting and it, it oh. just works. And to have that in an applied context worked for me, but like the kind of theoretical calculus, whatever, it just did not work for me. Yeah. And um, for some reason, it's, it's, it's just a different environment, a different context or something can, can absolutely change. And of course, like if the industry changes, if the world changes, the way we're doing business changes, then obviously people will change with it. And so, yeah. yeah. Do you think it's that flexible mindset then that's holding people back? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I think in 2024, we have to be a little bit more flexible. I think the pandemic also taught us that. Yes. We can't, we can't be too rigid on anything. We can't be rigid on policies and working from the office no. and that sort of thing. How did you do it really from hospitality to HR? I know we covered it at the beginning, mm -hmm. but more characteristic sides. Did you amend your resume in any way? Was mm -hmm. it more about your yourself as a person um, when you applied for jobs, um, how you sold yourself? Yeah. What was the the tactic? Yeah, I would say I, def I definitely had to sell myself in a certain perspective. Um, and so when I was uh, applying for my first kind of HR-ish role, I was leaning more towards experiences that I had as like, okay, I did a lot of training of younger students when I was working in the hotel of my school and, um, you know, onboarding them. New students had to learn all these processes and I would like teach them. And so there was always a perspective that I could spin it that I'm like, oh, this was like the people aspect. This was the, uh, the training aspect, the sort of payroll aspect of whatever I was doing. Um, 
to kind of, I don't want to say like convince someone, but kind of sell that uh, I had these skills or at least skills that could be transferable or easily like adapted yeah. um, to align with the role I was looking for. I, I feel like it could feel disingenuous to like maybe edit your CV in, in, in a way to just highlight certain experiences or certain uh, skills that you have based on um, the work that you did or maybe your thesis or, or uh, whatever it may be. Um, but it really is something that everyone is doing. Recruiters and hiring managers are so picky. Yeah. Uh, when we do LinkedIn searches, we're looking for certain words mm -hmm. and you can be left out of that search if you don't yeah. do that. Um, yeah, especially with, with AI tools and stuff coming into play. Oh, like, <laughs> big topic. Yeah, big, big topic. I don't know if we have enough time to dive into that. <laughs> no, I mean, I think people are also going back to the imposter syndrome bit. Yeah. Um, it's easy to sell yourself or oversell yourself on a mm -hmm. CV or on LinkedIn, but when you actually have to walk the walk yeah. and give examples in an interview um situational questions you have to answer them and you're just thinking i'm a fraud mm -hmm. I, I can't do this but like you said it's transferable skills i mean if you work in restaurants mm -hmm. anything people facing like the dentist assistant work i did yeah. or office management um even in a library i think they're very people facing yeah it's so transferable and i think as recruiters, you need to just spell that out for us. Yeah. Um, we'll see a title and just presume you're doing something. But mm -hmm. if you actually spell it out and tailor your CV, I yeah. think it's a really good uh, tip to that position. And yeah. just own it. It's diff It's easier said than done, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. Um, but just kind of read your resume maybe and like envision yourself mm -hmm. more towards that role and the future position. Mm -hmm. um, that's how... I did it in the past yeah, when I pivoted. Exactly. Uh, and if you did the same thing. And um, I feel like whenever I'm interviewing someone for a role and asking for some kind of experience, mm. I nowadays try to ask them about cert like the process of a project or something that they did. Because to me, that really highlights, um, it, it better highlights the skills. Because if you ask someone, it's like, oh, this is this role involves a lot of quantitative data research. Um, what are your quantitative data skills? Someone will like be like panic and think, yeah, but, but the hiring manager will be like, yeah, they need the quantitative data skills. And what does that really mean? Yeah. But if you ask someone, it's like, oh, have you had a, um, a research project that mainly focused on quantitative data that you can talk to me about, like talk to me about the process and that sort of thing. And someone will more easily describe the entire journey of how it was, what methods that they use and how they encountered a problem and solved the problem and that sort of thing. And then it becomes easier. And then in my mind, I can be like, okay, these are the transferable skills that apply to this role. Yeah. And so I'm doing the step instead of them stressing about how it yeah. fits and matches. It's also the recruiter's responsibility to ask more tailored questions instead of tell me about yourself. Yeah. There's some shitty interview questions. Like, mm -hmm. what do you want to do in five years time? I don't know what I want to do tomorrow. I don't I know don't what I want to do eat weekend. tonight. <laughs> exactly. I'm thinking about that now. Yeah. Um, what's like, so that question sounds really interesting um, mm -hmm. and it gets you the results that you want. Is there other like interview questions that you ask to get specific answers? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I would say when I really started um, doing a lot of interviews and stuff, I would have like a long list of all the questions I wanted to answer. Mm -hmm. And you quickly learn that that is not the way to do it and you will yeah. never get to answer all of those things. And so there are definitely some bullet points that I, I try to touch upon. Um, but I remember when I was hiring a lot of um, innovation analysts or innovation analyst interns, I would ask them to tell me about a fun fact that they learned about recently. Mm -hmm. And I would always start by saying a fun fact that I learned from from TikTok or something. And so I would I would share that um, there was this psychology study done in the U.S. Um, asking people about their roommates. And so they would rate their roommate from one to 10. And they would also wow. ask, they would also ask the person to predict what score the roommate would give them. Mm. And they found that across the board, across different cultures, different schools, different socioeconomic backgrounds, people always thought that their roommates hated them and they would rate them lower than they actually did. And they oh. like, they actually got higher scores than they thought they would, you know? And I was like, that's really interesting because then it tells you, it's like, oh, People like me more than I think that they do. And that's kind of comforting. And then it opens up the conversation and they would explain to me how they read an article about, um, I don't know, there's someone who's interested in, 
I don't know, green energy or something. It's like, oh my God, they made a huge breakthrough in nuclear reactors or something like that. And they show that excitement, they show that interest yeah. um, in, in what they see. And that usually opens up a really interesting conversation as well. Um, it tells me sometimes it, it really aligns with what the role is. Sometimes it's completely different. And so it can give you insight into like the character of the person, what their interests are. But also it really breaks the ice because it's something that is like, oh, this is something that I've probably never talked about in an interv inter interview before. Yeah. Uh, and so I really enjoyed doing that when I had an interview with a innovation analysts it's people are so scared yeah. of interviews um just they they recite scripts mm -hmm. there's like the google um interview trainer have you heard of that as well yeah. that people are doing um also youtube videos teaching people they practice with their friends etc because mm -hmm. they're so nervous so yeah. if you just show that you're human um and you like you did yeah. you go first and then it just breaks the ice yeah it helps you understand if does this person fit the company culture and also the yeah. team um, it's not always about the CV and like all the qualifications and all the skills yeah. and matching the job description 100%. Mm -hmm. Team fit, I think, is just so important because yeah. if this person doesn't gel well with the manager, doesn't get the company vision, really struggles to work with the others, is like isolated, doesn't work yeah. as a team, it's just hell for them. So it's just like, yeah, it's just, it's sad to see internally when that happens. So having these personalized questions is so important mm -hmm. i've been asking something really risky yeah um like here and there with some candidates just testing the water um instead of saying like what's your biggest achievement or what do you want to do in five years time i say what's your biggest fuck up and how mm -hmm. did you fix it mm -hmm. um tried that a few times and people are really afraid yeah oh because they have probably done something really bad that they can't say um but or, or maybe they haven't and they just can't rack their brains under yeah. pressure and think. But some of the answers I got are amazing. And for me, I'm not assessing whether you're a bad person or not. Mm -hmm. I'm just understanding, like, do you open up? Yeah. Are you honest and transparent if you've messed something up at work? What's your thought process? Do you report it? Do you go to someone? Do you try and hide it? Like, mm -hmm. how do you fix the problem? And if you don't, why? Yeah. That's kind of the ideology behind that and i've just been testing the water and i'm just saying it so if if i ask you that question and i'm interviewing <laughs> you i'm not trying to be a horrible person it's yeah. just a different way to like yeah break the ice because it's not all fluff sometimes you join a company because there are layoffs because it's a different strategy and it's a reorganization because the company's going a different way or because they have done something terribly and mm -hmm. they need to try and navigate so are you a fixer yeah you're not going into a perfect angelic situation. Like you need to fix stuff. So mm -hmm. how do you like assess that in an interview? So yeah. you have to be more, what are your achievements? Like it's so fluffy. Yeah. It doesn't, I don't know. It's good. Yeah. You get the achievements and yeah. stuff. And you want to, you want to interview like the real person, not the yeah. person that they're preparing for or mm. trying to rehearse. And mm. maybe they have like answered all these questions or done these like, preparation work before. I was like, these are my skills. These are my weaknesses. This is the little blurb about my life and what I'm going to share. But um, then, yeah, if, if you kind of catch someone off guard, then, yeah. you know, then you you see the real person. And in the end, we are hiring people. Yeah. You know, we're not hiring a list of pros and cons or uh, strengths and weaknesses. We want to work with a person. Yeah. When we went to the networking event, um, do you remember we spoke to, to the other recruiter and she mentioned that people were reciting chat GPT answers yeah. for like video interviews. And I thought, what's happening? What's going on? Like yeah. we're, we're losing touch with other people. We're not being ourselves. We're so prone to being perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, that everyone's sounding the same, even reciting the answers. I find that I wouldn't be able to. It would be very strange. Have you had that? No, um, I've, I've had people like like obviously use GPT for like motivation letters mm. and their applications and stuff like that. Um, but I haven't had an experience like the recruiter described that they were getting literally the same like bullet pointed answers. How, would you call people out? I think I would. I, I definitely would. But the thing is, is that I have no beef with people who use ChatGPT. It's, it's a tool yeah. and it's something that is in our industry and actually all over the world in every industry that is going to be used. And it's not like, oh, you, you use it on your application. It's not something you will use in your day-to-day -day life or, or working, wow. you know? Can you imagine? Let me yeah. just recite, like, conversations. I mean, it was people. the whole thing is like, oh, you have to learn all these calculation tables because you'll never have 
a calculator in your pocket everywhere you go, oh, that's right? That's true. So yeah. it's like, yeah, that's that was something that was kind of drilled into us. You have, you have to learn all of this thing. But um, yeah, we will have access to all these tools. We will have access to these translator tools. And I was going to say, how do you feel about languages then? Yeah. Do you think people will eventually stop learning and just use like Google Translate or Deepo or something? Yeah, I think it really depends on the kind of work. I think if um, I'm, I'm in my company, for example, we have like our business language in English, but we have colleagues who are speaking French that speak French to each other when they're working just with each other. And that works for them. And I feel like as long as you can find a common ground and it's effective, it just works. Yeah. I was just thinking about your interview question that relates with this as well. Well, I think I saw in the news is that in the near future, we might be able to speak with just our minds. Like, so you could see my thoughts. It would be so interesting to see how someone's mind works. I feel like I would have been diagnosed with ADHD a lot earlier. If, oh, wow. Because <laughs> then you would just see absolutely everything <laughs> happening all the time. Yeah. Do you think that helps you with project management in your in your work, having a variety of things? ADHD. Yeah, I don't know. I've never really thought about it. Really? Yeah, I think um, it's quite difficult for me to answer that question because it's not something I've lived without, you know, so I don't have a frame of reference to compare, compare it, it to. to. Yeah, for I just noticed with, you don't really have like a big team, but I noticed with colleagues that don't have it, that um, doing things uh, spontaneously, like mm. an email comes through, you have oh, to action yeah. it straight away. I can do that, but sometimes if it's I'm in the office and I'm really hyper focused in something, and someone taps my shoulder, yeah. Oh, I need you for this. I struggle. Like when you break my hyper focus, yeah. I struggle with that. Other people find that so it's switched almost. Like people can't juggle. Like they mm -hmm. have to finish one task then go on to the other, yeah. then go on to the other. And no, they don't I... have all the alerts on their Google calendar. <laughs> um, I need an alert for anything. Brush my teeth, mm -hmm. go to bed, like everything. Take a lunch. I need a break in my calendar yeah. to take my lunch. Otherwise, I'm really loving what I'm doing. Or it's like really I'm typing something out or I'm making a contract or something and I'm like mm -hmm. really focused. And then I yeah. just forget, especially when I'm at home. Yeah. I don't know if you get that as well. No, I definitely, if, if I have something that I absolutely have to do, I will block it like as a focus time in my mm. calendar. Um, but normally I'm, I'm just juggling through all those sort of things. And I, I think I definitely relate to is like, if I am hyper focused on something and I need to get something done and I'm in that like flow state, I'm like, do not interrupt me whatsoever. You need the but, sticker in the back. Like, yeah, do yeah. Not... <laughs> Under no circumstances. <laughs> do not make any small talk with me. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, um, definitely. I think I think I'm always juggling absolutely everything. I feel like in, in my mind right now, I could list five or six things that I'm I'm, I'm, I'm working on. You have 20 open tabs yeah. on your brain. Yeah, That's different windows, working. different things for absolutely everything. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, yeah, it, it's, it's just, just a different way of working. Yeah, and I think it's so amazing how nowadays it's not even frowned upon to be neurodivergent. And mm -hmm. it's actually, I feel like it's a superpower as well. I feel like we're just different. We're built different. Mm -hmm. and um, It makes us really passionate about the industry we're in. I don't think people understand that like mm -hmm. it's, we live for it and yeah. we obsess over it and we want to just succeed in it. So that's so um yeah, something that I really like about ADHD and being neurodivergent as well. I'm not shit talking people that don't have it. You're equally <laughs> as good. You're you're very uh, yeah good at what you do and you're very professional as well. Um, what else did I want to talk about? There goes about, the ADHD again. <laughs> yeah, just the impulsive uh, like the spontaneous thoughts. <laughs> Marcel, yep. it's been an absolute pleasure having you today. So if I was an intern or a candidate and I wanted to reach out to you, what's the best way? Yeah, so you can always uh, find me on LinkedIn. I'm sure you'll tag me in uh, all of these uh, posts and stuff you're doing. Um, yeah, we have roles open pretty often. We have uh, intern roles uh, quite regularly throughout the year open. Um, at the moment, we don't have any roles that I can plug, but... Um, always keep an eye out on our, our careers page for dealroom.co. You can follow dealroom.co uh, on LinkedIn as well um, and keep posted. We are always posting all these really interesting reports about different industries. So um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, give it a follow. Thank you so much as well for you. This has been lovely to talk. Had a great time. <laughs>